Welcome to Trench Diaries. Iron Coffins, Part 2. We toasted the success, then sat down for dinner where the news was the main topic of discussion. With a steadily increasing number of U boats cruising the seas, the toll on British shipping was reaching unprecedented levels. Indeed, we had reason to believe that our blockade against England would soon result in her downfall. On land, our armies had driven deep into enemy territory. Following our conquest of Poland, Norway had been defeated almost overnight. Holland, Belgium, and France were overrun within a few weeks, and Denmark had been occupied. Our capital ships controlled the European waters far into the Arctic region. It seemed to me one thing remained to be done intensify the U boat offensive against England. Starve the British and force them to surrender. Once we held the British Isles, the war would end. After lunch, we newcomers congregated on deck to await orders. Finally, at 14:30, the adjutant passed our crowd waving a few white pieces of paper. We followed him into the officers' mess and formed a circle around him, drawing nervously on our cigarettes while he sorted his sheets. At last, the adjutant began to speak. He called our names in alphabetical order. Specified our boats and the port where each one was to be boarded. Since my name was at the end of the list, my patience was put to a severe test. Some of us were lucky and were assigned to a boat moored at this very pier. Others had to travel to faraway ports. The adjutant concluded by saying, Those who have to report to Bremerhaven, Danzig, or Konigsberg must leave with the next train. There is no time for a long goodbye with your sweetheart's gentlemen. Ensign Werner stays aboard the Lech for a special assignment. I was stunned. Hopeful that this was all a mistake, I approached the young adjutant and asked why I had been left stranded aboard the Lech. Don't you worry, he said disdainfully. You will get to the front fast enough. Your boat, U551, is still on mission. You have to wait until she returns. When will that be, sir? I can't tell exactly. But if it makes you feel better, I've heard the boat has radioed that she has aborted her patrol. I was relieved to hear that I was to join an experienced crew, but I was a disappointed and envious ensign when I shook hands with my departing classmates. Later that afternoon, I was told to hold myself at the adjutant's disposal. My main duty was to take officers aboard motor launches and shuttle them across the bay to Kiel and the shipyards. I had expected huge responsibilities, instead, I was asked to perform a something that any petty officer could have done as well. I tried in vain to convince the adjutant that I had never handled a small craft. We shall see, he said, taking me aboard one of the launches. If you haven't done it before, you will learn. Despite my best efforts to do the job poorly, the adjutant seemed satisfied. To my displeasure, I suddenly found myself in charge of all the motorboats. Several days passed and U551 had not returned from patrol. From time to time I went to see the communication officer in search of news. I became ever more restless as I watched my classmates prepare for their first war patrol. Then came the day that shattered my hopes for an early sailing. The adjutant brought me the bad news that U551 would never return. She had been lost in the North Atlantic. I expected to be transferred aboard another U-boat immediately, but when nothing happened after several more days, I became uneasy. I suspected that the adjutant had intentionally neglected to arrange a new assignment. One day at breakfast I arranged to sit next to the flotilla's chief engineer, whom I had regarded as an approachable man. After some small talk, I discreetly explained my situation. The chief promised to do something on my behalf. Though I was not quite as sure he had made the promise in earnest, results came immediately. The next afternoon I was told to see the adjutant. Stern-faced, he handed me a sheet of paper. I realized instantly that it was my new order. I clicked my heels in sudden joy, saluted, and left his office quickly. Outside, I read the order in detail. I was to report aboard U557 in Königsberg. I was ecstatic. Before I left Kiel, I had managed to send a wire to my girlfriend Marianne in Berlin. I had not seen her since the previous December and a reunion was long overdue. As usual, we planned to meet in a small cafe near the Scala Theater. I knew Marianne was as reliable as she was beautiful and she was just five minutes late, quite remarkable for such a pretty woman. 
Her face and blue eyes glowed as they had when I had first met her before the war on Lake Constance. We sat and talked happily for a few minutes, and when we left the cafe there was the unspoken agreement between us that we would not separate that night. After spending the afternoon together walking through Berlin, we had assumed finding a small hotel or bed and breakfast would be easy. But we rang dozens of bells and no door opened for us. We walked up and down for almost an hour before we found a little place and a tiny room to stay in. It was big enough for the two of us, as we did not require much space to be content. Long after midnight, the air raid sirens began to blare. I had forgotten that there was a war on and that the Tommies occasionally slipped through our air defense. After some hesitation, we decided to remain where we were and not seek shelter. While the flak hammered sporadically, we heard the howling of falling bombs accompanied by muffled explosions. The building vibrated slightly. When the raid was finally over, we had learned that defiance sometimes can be sweet. The next morning, the world looked as peaceful as always on this day of April 1941. Stores, cafes and hotels were doing business as usual. When the church bells rang the hour, it was like any sunny Sunday before the war. Time to say goodbye always comes too early, especially when duty calls while oneself stays in a shared hotel room with a girl. That day I was not quite sure whether I would have preferred a further delay of my departure. Although I felt quite comfortable in my love for Marianne, I regarded my love for the Navy as being of a more permanent nature. It was still quite early when we kissed goodbye at the station and we promised to see each other again as soon as the war would allow. I arrived in Konigsberg at dusk. I was astonished to see the station fully illuminated, as if in peace time. Streetlights, neon signs, storefronts and windows were ablaze with light. Despite the vague directions given to me by a policeman, I found the Navy Yard where I was to board U-557. Several U-boats swayed alongside a granite jetty and for a moment I paused at the pier and stared at the black dagger-shaped machines in the murky waters, wondering which one would carry me into battle against England. Some distance away lay an ocean liner. It was painted blindingly white and lit up like a Christmas tree. Assuming that the white ship was the flotilla's headquarters, I dragged my baggage across the gangway and reported to the officer of the watch. He referred me to the mate on duty and the mate sent me to the purser who in turn arranged for a cabin. I eventually fell into a soft reclining chair, hungry and exhausted. At last, I had arrived. It was very late when I went on an expedition through the ship to find the dining room and something to eat. In passing the bar I recognized my classmates Gunter Gerloff and Rolf Gubel, who had departed from Kiel some two weeks before me. Approaching them from behind, I tapped their shoulders and said, how come you are not at sea? They spun around. Chubby-faced Goobel replied, It's none of your business you landlubber. We just came back from a long training cruise. Gerloff, tall and blonde, added smilingly, You see the salt crusts on our lips? They don't dissolve in water, so we have to use alcohol. That's how long we've been at sea. I'll match that soon I countered. Not if they keep you in port to run their motorboats. Snapped Google. You 557. Do you fellows know where I can find her? She happens to be ours, Gerloff said, and the captain will have a stroke when he hears that you'll be joining. The talkative pair began to tell of their first experience aboard a U boat. Their enthusiasm for the weapon system as well as the captain and the crew seemed sincere and not the result of increased consumption of alcohol. I forgot my hunger and listened carefully washing down their tails with a few more drinks than I was accustomed to. It was past midnight when I finally lay my spinning head on a pillow. The next morning at 0800, I boarded U-557 to report for duty. The boat was weather-beaten. The conning tower looked like a surrealistic painting and the protective red undercoat showed in streaks through the splintered grey surface paint. Rust had formed everywhere, even around the barrel of the heavily greased 8.8cm deck gun. There was a light green shine of algae on the wooden deck that covered the steel hull. Her rundown appearance was obviously the result of months of drills in the Baltic. I found it very appealing. I presented my transfer orders to the captain and said, Herr Oberleutnant, I beg to report aboard. He glanced at the paper, then shouted, What the hell is wrong with headquarters? Sending me another ensign? They've already punished me with two just like you. Damned beginners who haven't smelled real U-boat stink. Then, with a vivid sigh, 
he expressed the hope that I might be useful as extra ballast. I was disappointed by my welcome, but not by the captain. Oberleutnant Ottokar Paulson was a short, stocky man in his early 30s. He had blonde hair and bright blue eyes that sparkled under the peak of his white navy cap. The white cap, which only the commander had the right to wear aboard, showed traces of patina on its brass ornaments. He wore a long jacket of light grey leather and it seemed that the shoulders and pockets had been expertly hand-stitched with a heavy yarn. An ornate seaman's braid was fastened at his left epaulette with thread bleached almost white. His feet, cased in large leather boots, stuck out beneath his wrinkled pants. In short, Paulson fitted my picture of the ideal U-boat commander. With no regard for formalities, the captain bluntly ordered me to change out of my dress uniform, then turned me over to his second officer. This slim and wiry man, possibly two years my senior, introduced himself as Lieutenant Seibold, second watch and radio officer. We shook hands heartily. Seibold answered many of my questions before I asked them. He told me that U-557 had just completed a strenuous seven-month shakedown cruise in the Baltic. The boat's company totaled 48 men, not counting us ensigns. It consisted of four officers, three warrant officers, 14 petty officers and 27 seamen, machinists and technicians. Some of the men had already seen action and with them as a core unit, Paulson had forged boat and crew into an effective combat machine, ready and eager for the gruesome work that lay ahead. Paulson himself, Seibold continued proudly, was a veteran of the underseas force. He had served aboard a U-boat in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War, cruising the Mediterranean and the Bay of Biscay. Later, Paulson trained many of the crews now manning U-boats in the North Atlantic. At the end of this little history lesson, Seibold ordered the first seaman's mate to take care of my immediate needs. The mate led me back to the ocean liner. There, I was equipped with three sets of fatigues, a full leather overall, an oilskin outfit for bad weather, two blue sweaters, blue knitted underwear, rubber boots, felt-lined leather boots, thick gloves, binoculars, and a multitude of small items. To secure all this gear I had to make no less than three trips from the supply room to my cabin in the liner. I was putting on my fresh fatigues when Google rushed into my cabin, almost smashing the door off its hinges. Hey sailor, pack your bags. We are sailing at 1400, destination Kiel. Damn it, I snarled, that's where I just came from. I packed in a hurry, carried all my belongings aboard U557, and threw them into one of the narrow berths. At exactly 1400 hours, U557 separated from the pier. The boat slid away in complete silence, powered by electric motors. She maneuvered into navigable waters, then her diesels took over. U557 headed for the open sea, 